The promise today is that I'm going to show you how to double sales without increasing operating expenses. So simple, exciting. But I need to clarify what I mean by doubling sales because um, um, this promise as it's written here or as you're likely to interpret it is almost certainly impossible. If we interpret sales as meaning your revenues, is it reasonable to expect to double revenues during any sensible time horizon? Probably not. So um, as is always the case when I use the word sales at Ballistics or when we use the word sales, we, 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 we use the term sales to mean something quite specific. So we differentiate between sales and transactions. A sale in, in our lexicon is when you go to an existing client and sell them something that's materially different from that which they are currently purchasing. Or when you go to a potential account and convert them into an existing account. So we're referring exclusively to business development here. So what I'm promising is to double your volume of new business transactions as opposed to repeat business transactions. So you could say to yourself, well, was it worth the cost of gas to get here? We're not going to double revenues after all. But my suggestion is that um, doubling new business transactions is as exciting, if not more exciting, when you take into account that in most of your cases, those new business transactions have a tail attached to them. They're annuities. Each time you convince a new account to purchase for the first time, or an existing account to purchase a service line from you that they're not currently purchasing, the whole of life value of that first transaction is, is in most cases, sig significantly greater than the first transaction. Is that a fair call? Okay. So that's the promise. Double your volume of sales, and by sales I mean new business transactions, without increasing operating expenses. And I hope that um, the promise is still exciting enough to convince you to stay, or if not, the food is decent enough you know, to, to uh, convince you to tough it out. So um, before I dig into this, I need to ask a couple of questions. And the good news is if you can answer yes to both of those questions, this promise is probably deliverable. So the first question is, do you have in your business at this point in time additional production or delivery capacity that's, and by additional I mean capacity that isn't being utilized? In other words, if you sold more, could you deliver it without having to race out and employ more people or buy more plant and equipment? Okay. Yeah? What about the rest of you? Yeah. So the first question is, do you have unutilized delivery capacity? I'm going to use the word plant today. And the reason I'm going to use terms like plant is, well, two reasons. One, we work with a lot of manufacturers. But, but secondly, it, it, it's a lot easier to talk to, to you all as if you're manufacturers, in spite of the fact that probably none of you are, because of the fact that the terminology is nice and concrete. You're going to understand what I'm talking about. But I'm going to have to ask you to convert some of those terms back to your own verbiage. So, for example, if you have a knowledge-based business, and if I'm talking about the plant, then in your case, the plant might be the team of people who process mortgage documents or uh, um, uh, whatever the case is. It might be a team of people as opposed to traditional plant and equipment. But the concepts will be just as applicable. So the first question is, do you have unutilized production capacity? The second question is, is your market share less than, and this number isn't important, but let's say less than 30%. So question one, do you have unutilized capacity? Number two is your market share less than 20 or 30%. What do you think? Yep. Okay. I see a lot of nods. Um, so the good news is if you can answer yes to both of those questions, I'm reasonably confident I can show you how to double your volume of sales without increasing operating expenses. But rather than taking the promise at face value, what I'd like to do is to dig into the implication of your answers in the affirmative to, the, to those two questions, because I think what we're going to find is there's some interesting concepts that flow out of an exploration of those uh, of, of the meaning of your answers to those two simple questions. So let's start with the first question: Do you have um, production capacity? I want to start with a a graph. I wouldn't be a consultant if I didn't draw a graph, and. Um, on this graph, I want to start by drawing a line that represents your delivery capacity, be it plant and equipment, be it knowledge workers, whatever the case is. So that line's going to be somewhere on the graph. We're not going to draw any numbers on the axis, so it doesn't much matter where I draw the line. Let's draw it here. So this line here represents your delivery capacity. So when you pay your operating expenses every month, or when your accounts department writes a check for, the, for those operating expenses, for the most part, 
what your accounts department is paying for is your delivery capacity, the plant and equipment, the room full of people, whatever the case is, or rooms full of people. How are you? Grab a seat. There you go. So this line here represents that plant capacity or, business, or delivery capacity that your finance department pays for each month. The next question, or the next line I'd like to draw, represents your current utilization of that delivery capacity. So if I was to draw a line that maps the utilization over time, this axis is time, this one's dollars, what would the second line look like? It'd be below it, yes. <laughs> we covered, that, covered off on that already. And what would the shape of the line be like? Your delivery capacity is relatively constant, isn't it? But if we were to chart the utilization of the delivery capacity, interesting, it's going to be cyclical or variable. In most cases, it's going to be both variable and cyclical. OK. Fair enough. Now, this chart's missing a line. The line that the chart is missing that I'd like to see on here is a line representing the market demand in aggregate for what you sell. So you can define your space however you like, the space in which you play. My question is, if we were to draw a line on this chart representing the aggregate market demand within that space, where would the line be and what would it look like? It'll, it'll be variable and much higher. So it's going to be significantly higher. Now, we know it's going to be significantly higher, don't we? Because the second question I asked is, what's your market share? We all agreed less than 20 or 30%. So if we tote up the, 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 the total demand out there in the marketplace and draw a line to represent that, it's probably going to be up here somewhere. Now, the shape of the line, you said it's going to be cyclical. It's also going to be variable. A little bit variable, very variable. Well, let's talk about the current market. A little bit variable or very variable? <laughs> very variable. So let's assume it bounces around all over the shop. Okay? And let's assume every now and again, right about here, for example, we have a catastrophe. Okay? The demand drops, boom, like a stone. How far does it drop? Okay, so let's talk in averages. Or let's talk about your industry. <laughs> you can have it, you can do one or the other, but you can't have it both ways. How far does it drop? Does it drop so far that it impinges on your plant capacity? It can. Is it likely to, though? We've had a... Well, hang on, hang on. No, no, no. I'm not asking do you choose to drop... Are you, well, so if you shed staff, are you shedding staff because the total market demand for your services has dropped below your plant capacity? No, that's highly unlikely, isn't it? If your market share is 20 or 30%, I suspect most of you it's a fraction of that. It's unconscionable, no matter how bad a recession is, that the aggregate market demand for products and services within your space would drop to the point where it would start to impinge upon your delivery capacity. It just ain't going to happen. Fair call? So we have a catastrophe and the market finds its way back. Okay, now this is the point that I wanted to make. Okay. Recessions suck, but most organizations, in my experience, are affected by recessions and other negative variation in market demand to a far greater extent than they should be, and here's why. If the market demand in aggregate is always significantly greater than your plant capacity, what's the excuse for not selling all the plant capacity? Now, if you stop people in the street who haven't been privy to the last five minutes of this interesting thesis, or the first five minutes of this in interesting thesis, they're going to say, well, the reason we're quiet is because of the market. But we've just dispatched, dispatched that excuse, haven't we? You can't say that. You can't say, well, we had to lay people off because of the recession. That's at least mathematically not true. The recession didn't cause demand to drop to the point where it impinged upon your production capacity. So what we need to do is recognize something very interesting about the way that your organizations, or at least a typical organization, is designed. And the, the, the realization is this. A typical organization, if we consider that it consists of two basic functions, let's draw them. 
This function here is the sales function. So it's kind of like a machine with two, with two moving parts. We have the sales function and we have the production or delivery. I'll say P for production. And I'm, I'm being pretty non-specific here. Production's gonna refer to everything that isn't sales, finance, and admin. In other words, um, 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 delivery, manufacturing, uh, engineering, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so we'll use the term generally. So if we think of the business as consisting of two basic functions, sales and production, what we have to conclude when we look at this chart here is a business for which this chart is a reasonable representation of their current situation. The sales function has greater than or less capacity than their production function. Greater than? If the sales function had greater capacity than the production function, wouldn't the plant be fully utilized? Well, if they're not performing, then they don't have the capacity. If you have a machine in your plant and it's broken, can you count a perfect machine in the calculation of your plant capacity? No. So, what do you reckon? In this current situation, does the sales function have greater or less capacity than the production function? It has less. Interesting realization. So someone in your business has designed it in such a way as to put you in a position where the sales function has less capacity than the production function. Putting you in, in the situation that you're in currently, and I'm talking about a hypothetical situation, putting you in the situation where, in spite of the fact that the market demand, no, no matter how bad times are in aggregate, is significantly greater than your delivery capacity, you are nonetheless in a situation where you're failing to sell all of that delivery capacity. Does it make sense to be in that situation? Let's look at things from an investor's point of view, okay? You invest in a business, and all of, mo many of you have invested in your own business. So you inve what your, your investments re will refer to as shareholders' equity. Your shareholders' equity goes into the business, okay? Where does most of it end up? What part of the business does, consumes most of your shareholders' equity? Production. Production and, you know, delivery. So your goal as a manager is what? Come on in, grab a seat. Your goal as a manager is to do what? Hi. Minimize costs? Uh, no, I don't think that's, that, that's, a, uh, that's maybe an intermediate objective, but it's hardly the goal. What's the goal? Yeah, to, what, to maximize, with the, uh, most people say to make money, and make money is a good enough approximation, but Ben's just given the technically correct answer. Your job as a manager is to maximize your return on shareholders' equity. Where's most of the shareholders' equity? In production. So if we were to sit down and design a business from scratch, would it make sense to design it in such a way that all the shareholders' equity went into plant and equipment, or... Uh, your knowledge workers in a knowledge environment, knowledge-based environment, <laughs> giving us capacity of X units per month, and then we take some remaining dollars and build a sales function which has a capacity of less than X units a month. Does that make sense? It flat out doesn't make sense. But I've got to say, when I talk to organizations here and in the US, what I find over and over again is that Regardless of whether, in whether anyone intended it to be this way or not, and I expect they didn't, most businesses are structured in such a way that the sales function does not have the capacity to consistently keep production busy, week in and week out. And that doesn't make sense. Your job as managers is to maximize your return on shareholders' equity. The shareholders' equity is in production. That, mean it's in that means it's incumbent upon you. Your mandate puts you in a situation where you have no choice but to either reduce production capacity until your plant is small enough to stay busy all the time, or the alternative is to increase sales capacity. And we really should be acknowledging that it wasn't really a smart idea to engineer our sales function in the first instance. To find ourselves in the situation where the sales function has less capacity than production function. Now, the interesting thing, of course, is that most organizations don't engineer their sales functions, do they? Their sales functions evolve. 
So what happens is you probably start with standard practices and the sales function evolves from standard practices. In most cases, nobody sits down and thinks about engineering the sales function in the same way that we would think about engineering the engineering function or engineering the production function. And if you're interested in the concept of engineering the sales function, then the good news is you're definitely in the right place because that's all I'm going to talk about for the next hour, how to engineer the sales function. Okay. So we have an objective. Okay, the objective is we need to increase significantly the capacity of the sales function. Okay, and when I say significantly, the reality is we know how much we have to increase it. So here's the end state we'd like to achieve. We have sales here, and we have production here. Our objective should be for production to be fully utilized at all times. Now, are we ever going to eliminate the variability in the marketplace? the market is always going to be cyclical, and on top of the cyclic nature of demand, there's also going to be some variability. Stuff happens from time to time. So what that means is that our sales function has to have significant capacity, not just to sell all of production capacity, but to sell more than production has the capacity to produce. Why do we want to sell more than production has the capacity to produce? Well, to grow, yes. To variability. What do we want to do to the variability? Yeah, so to do that we have to buffer production. So what that means is to maximize the profitability of the business, we need to maintain a buffer of orders at all times upstream from production. And that buffer of orders, that X number of days worth of pre-sold but unstarted work, has to be significant enough in size to absorb market fluctuations. So this should be the mandate of sales, should it not? To build and maintain a queue of orders significant enough in size to absorb market variability and to ensure that production operates at 100% utilization 100% of the time. In reality, so yeah, your question is a good one. Your question is, if we build a queue of work upstream from production, does that cause production lead times to blow out? The reality is the opposite occurs. If you have an infrequent load on production, what can you tell me about production efficiencies? They're rubbish. Okay, Production people get used to operating at, yeah, okay. What ends up happening is if you keep production fully loaded with work, you end up with fantastic production efficiencies. So even though you maintain a queue of work upstream from production, you end up with shorter lead times than you would if there were no queue, but an enormous amount of variability. Do you okay. Like the size of that queue, though, that's beyond which point you're going to sell things and then not the wrong time. Yeah, yeah. So if we look at the size of the queue, there's going to be an optimal zone. The queue needs to be big enough to ensure that production stays busy but not so big as to cause your quoted lead time to expand beyond what the market has tolerance for. Okay. Um, okay, so this should be the mandate of sales. If we were to stop sales managers or directors of sales and interview them and say, what's your mandate? What's your job description? Do you think if they were, relate, were to, to, to relate to us their job description, it would sound anything like the mandate that I just suggested? Would they say, Justin, that's a very good question. I'm glad you asked. My mandate is to build and maintain a queue of forward sold work upstream from production significant enough. In are they going to say anything like that? Of course not. What are they going to say? My job is to sell. How much? How much do you want to sell? As much as possible. Now, this is very scary. If I were to interview one of your sales managers or one of your salespeople and say to that person, what's your mandate? And they were to say to sell, and I was to ask how much, and they were to say as much as possible, there is an implicit assumption that your organization is designed in such a way to put you in the position where you have more production capacity than sales believes they ever can realistically sell. Okay. So... This is the problem that we have to address. And as I said before, there are two ways to address it. We can address it by 
selling off plant and equipment, to reducing the capacity of the firm, or we can address it by increasing the capacity of sales. So that's our objective. Increase capacity of sales. Now this should be easy, right? We just gather all of our sales people together and tell them to sell more. <laughs> Lucky the food's good. <laughs> There's not a lot here for you to, to learn. So what happens if we do that? We gather our sales people together and say, look here, you lazy buggers, you have to go out there and sell more. Problem solved? What happens? Nothing happens. You've tried that already, haven't you? Okay, nothing happens. So if that doesn't work, what's the next thing that we need to do to increase sales? Employ more people. Yeah. So we have five people on our sales team, and that's causing us to generate 500,000 a month in sales. So we go and recruit another, maybe a million a month in sales. So we go and recruit another five sales people, and our sales go from a million a month to two million a month. Is that what happens? No, it doesn't. So we have sales of a million a month in reality. We recruit, we double the size of the sales team. What do we realistically expect sales to increase to? 1.5? You'd be lucky. 1.2 maybe. So on most occasions when we work with organizations, they're working with us because they've tried that game and discovered it doesn't work too well. You know, salespeople are expensive. In most cases, the increment in sales is not enough to cover the additional salary cost of all those salespeople, let alone to cover the management cost of the infrastructure required to maintain a team of that size. This doesn't work. So we could spend all day talking about why increasing the size of the sales team doesn't in reality increase sales by commensurate amount, but let me suggest two reasons why. The first reason why is that your salespeople, for the most part, are not selling. Two reasons why. The first reason is, remember, in today's discussion, we're using a very deliberate definition of the word sales. What do I mean by sales? Winning new accounts or selling new service lines to existing accounts. That's what I mean by sales. Most salespeople spend most of their time doing what? Processing transactions. Processing transactions. The balance of their time is spent on what? Admin. Yeah. So most of your salespeople, if we were to look at how, if we were to do a time and motion study and look at how their time is applied to activities, we will discover that most of their time is spent processing transactions, performing customer service, doing administration and clerical tasks, and a small percentage of their time is dedicated to what I'm going to call today selling, new business development. Here's the reality. There's been a number of studies in different countries, they all return the same result. A typical salesperson spends 10% of his or her time in the field actually selling. And I've got to say, we work with a range of organizations from different industries here and in the US, and the number is always the same. A salesperson who does nothing other than sell has the capacity to do about 20 business development meetings a week, four a day, assuming that they are planned sensibly. But in reality, your salespeople, if yours is anything like a typical organization, are doing two business development meetings a week. So they have the capacity to do 20, but in reality they do two. So the number one reason why increasing the size of your sales team does not produce the increase in sales that you're expecting is that for the most part, salespeople are not selling, they are processing transactions. Where are the transactions coming from? The existing account base. So you double the size of your sales team. Do you double the size of your existing account base automatically just by virtue of the fact that you've employed more salespeople? No. The account base stays exactly the same size. And your business development activity increases incrementally. It takes about three or four weeks for your salespeople to get tired of prospecting and to emulate the activities of your existing salespeople. In most, most cases, what happens is often accounts are allocated to them so that they can while away their time sitting by the phone waiting it to ring so that they can process a transaction. I'm being too harsh, of course. I can see all of you are up in arms because it's just preposterous. Nothing like that would happen in your firms. Okay. The other reason why salespeople, um, why sales doesn't increase commensurate with 
a significant increase in the size of your sales team, is that contrary to popular belief, salespeople do not originate their own sales opportunities. So do, sales so do salespeople prospect? Yes, they do. Do most of salespeople's new business opportunities emerge as a consequence of their prospecting? No, they don't. It's probably truer to say that salespeople discover sales opportunities in spite of, not because of their prospecting activities. So sales opportunities drop like manna from the heavens and bump salespeople on the nose as they're going about their otherwise unproductive prospecting activities. The problem with prospecting is not that salespeople are incapable of it. They are capable of it, but that it's a dumb thing for them to do. Uh, Peter, are you capable of walking to Sydney? You are. You look relatively healthy. If we gave you a backpack and a, you know, and a camel with a good supply of water, you could walk from here to Sydney. The problem with walking from here to Sydney is what? It's what? You get sore feet. No, I, think, I don't think that's the real problem. I'm not much concerned about your sore feet, to be frank. My concern is that there are probably better uses of your time. We, it would take you a lot, a lot of time. And when you're doing that, there's not a lot of other things you could be doing. You could be doing sales appointments. Wouldn't it be a better idea to put you on a plane and fly you to Sydney and then invest the time that we saved in something that produced a better yield on your valuable capacity? Same thing applies to salespeople. Can salespeople prospect? Of course they can. There's all sorts of things that salespeople can do. They can crawl around on their hands and knees under desks and fix computers as well in many cases. They can hang stuff on the wall. You know, Most of them have basic technical skills. that We could equip them with spanners and screwdrivers and they could do all sorts of stuff. But the problem is that most of the activities that salespeople are performing do not produce anywhere near the yield on their limited capacity that the one activity that they should be performing does, and that one activity that we'd like them to be performing is what? Selling. So the idea is not that salespeople can't prospect, they can. It's not that salespeople can't type data in your dumb CRM, they can do that too. It's that it just doesn't make sense to have salespeople typing in your CRM, prospecting, or walking to Sydney. Because it just so happens there are better things that these people could be doing with their time. And the fact that you pay them 80, 100, 120, or two or three hundred thousand dollars in some markets is indicative of the fact that there are better things that they can do with their time. You want to know where we find those salespeople who are prepared to work for $200,000? <laughs> okay, fair argument? Okay, so the problem here is our mandate is to increase significantly the capacity of sales, and we're fairly confident that neither putting them in a room and asking them to sell more, nor doubling the size of the sales function is going to work. What do we need to do? Work smarter. Now, your answer is absolutely correct. We need, we need the sales function to work smarter. But I'm not going to suggest that we need sales people to work smarter. Because if we, were to fra if we were to use the latter phrasing, the uh, unspoken assumption is that the issue is with the sales people. But my suggestion here is that the issue is with management. We have built a pretty dumb environment that has Buckley's of operating productively. Would any of us, unless we were taking some pretty serious hallucinogenics, consider structuring our manufacturing function or our delivery function the way that sales is structured? Think about how we approach sales. We put an ad in the paper and we employ a geezer. Okay. And we size them up and we say, yep, this person's definitely a geezer. And then we give them, we hand them absolute 100% ownership of the sales function. We say, you now own this responsibility. Go forth, rape and plunder, and generate bounty. Is that what we do? I'm exaggerating a little, but that's exactly what we do. We hand the responsibility for the entire sales function to an individual, we put them on commission, and we hope for the best. And then we stand around and bitch about the fact that the environment, relative to the rest of the organizations, is not particularly efficient. Now, the interesting thing about this discussion is there was a point in time where we approached the entire organization. What I'm thinking about here is production. There was a point in time where we used to approach production the same way that we approach sales today. How far back in time would we have to travel to find that point in time where the production function looks like the sales function looks today. Pre-industrial revolution. So we'd have to go back, yeah, definitely, maybe the guild system. So we would have to go back before Division A. We would have to go back 150 
years in all likelihood to find that point in time where manufacturing looked like and was operated like sales is operated today. That's a pretty sad indictment on the design of the sales function, is it not? But that's okay. The reason it's okay and the reason we shouldn't be too dissatisfied with ourselves is that we've been busy for the last 150 odd years doing stuff. If we think of the history of industry in the last hundred years, what have we, and by we I mean management, what have we been busy doing? Think of the story of the last hundred years. What's the big, what's the big headline? What's happened? So we've seen massive increases in, of, in productivity, in, in production environments. Efficiency, and you can measure them using whatever standard you reasonably want, whether it's return on capital, whether it's return on head hours, whatever you like. And in conjunction with that, we've in, with with that we've seen massive and uh, unprecedented increases in the quality of living, standard of living that we um, all have in the Western world. What's the headline? What's been, the, what's been the cause of this massive period of change we've been through in the last 150 years? It's, it's industrialization, isn't it? Okay, so the reason we're excused from having a sales function that looks like production used to look 100 years ago is that we've been busy on production. Fair call? That movie um, about the um, baseball player um, um, is famous for those words, build it and he'll come, or it's commonly misquoted, build it and they'll come. And, and nowadays, we, it's, it's almost belittling. If you suggest to an executive that their strategy is build it and they will come. But for most of the recent history of industry, that hasn't been the case. It has been the case that the entrepreneur who has the ability to build something better, faster, cheaper, ends up with the market and the riches. So what's happened in the last hundred odd years is we've been busy fixing production and the spoils have been enormous. But if you look at the productivity curve, what you're going to realize is the curve has started to flatten out. Okay. You know, it, it was in recent times that Ford, that, that Toyota had a massive lead on Ford. Nowadays, Ford is beating Toyota in the quality surveys. Hyundai is coming scary close to beating Toyota in the, okay. So the potential in manufacturing is leveled out. My suggestion is that management needs to shift its focus from manufacturing to sales because that's where the upside is. So we have a sales function that looks like production used to look 100 years ago. That's the bad news. The good news is, well, so does everyone else. But the other good news is that we know how to, we know how to fix it. We know exactly what to do to fix it because we've played this game before, haven't we? We've been busy for the last 150 years fixing production. And we've transitioned production from looking exactly how sales looks today to looking quite special with enormous consequences for us and for everyone else. Okay? So today is about doing exactly that to sales. Okay? There's the upside. We take the sales function, which, you know, a typical sales function consists of one or two artisans operating in a craft shop environment. Okay? And we industrialize sales. Okay, so let's talk about how we're going to industrialize sales. If we were to look and try and identify the core idea behind industrialization, the core idea is so, division of labor. That's the big idea, isn't it? Uh, division of labor is the cause of the massive increase in productivity we've seen in the last 100 years. So that's exactly what we need to do to sales, division of labor. That's where all the productivity came from. If you read Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations, talks about a pin manufacturer that applied division of labor to the manufacture of pins. So as a consequence of taking the production of pins from a single individual, splitting it into, I think, 10 or 15 tasks and allocating those tasks to specialists, he increased the productivity, or this particular firm that Smith was, uh, was studying, increased the productivity by, can anyone guess how many times? 
It was 20,000 times. Just by applying division of labor. So this is pre-robotics. Okay, people say, well, the industrialization was all about mechanization. It's rubbish. It had nothing to do with tools and mechanization. I mean, they, it had something to do with it, but the central idea was division of labor. Okay, so there's what we're going to do, division of labor. And the rest of today is just talking about how we're going to implement division of labor without making a mess. Okay. I don't want to spend too much time selling the benefits of division of labor because the benefits of division of labor are all around us. I don't think any of us would like to go back to living in a time where things were as they were 150 years ago. Probably not even 60 years ago. Okay. But the problem with division of labor is that while the bounty of division of labor has been huge, the road that we've had to travel to get to the point where we've made this game work properly has been perilous. So division of labor, if you do it correctly, the benefits are enormous. But there are infinitely more ways to do it incorrectly than there are to do it correctly. So let me try and make that a little more concrete. If you were to suggest, to, if you were to leave, the, maybe you have an important telephone call and you leave this presentation and you go back to your team and you say, that was kind of an interesting presentation. They suggested, or Justin suggested, that we apply division of labor to the sales function. And the idea seems interesting because if you think about it, salespeople do a lot of stuff they shouldn't be doing. Maybe they should just sell. So it's an interesting idea. You present that to your salespeople. What's your salespeople's objection going to be? Lack of control. So if salespeople no longer have control because all they're doing is selling, what are the consequences of their ab abdication of complete control going to be? Huh? Yeah, but what are the consequences going to be? Everything's going to go pear-shaped. Are they going to argue that? They're going to say stuff won't be delivered on time. Clients will get the box and they'll open the box and they'll have the wrong stuff in it. Are sales, is that going to be salespeople's concern? Opportunities will be lost, and accounts will be lost. What we need to recognize before we embark on this journey is that salespeople's intuition is absolutely correct. Absolutely correct. If you were to apply division of labor carelessly to your organizations, you would absolutely destroy your quality of service. You would win less accounts, and you would lose a scary percentage of the accounts that you currently have. Your operational performance would go pear-shaped. Okay, And we're going to discover why as we dig into this discussion here. Before we do that, however, what I want to do is propose what I think are the three critical prerequisites that have to be in place in order for division of labor to work. Now, this is not just in a sales environment. This is in any environment. So I'm going to talk about two other, two other types of environment. I'm going to talk about a production environment. We're all familiar with what a production environment looks like, a factory. But I'm also going to talk today about a project environment. And it's project environments that should be of more interest to us, certainly those of us who sell major products and services, because project environments are scarily similar to sales environments. If you're selling something that's big and expensive, is it fair to characterize a sales opportunity as a project? It is, isn't it? Now, all of you, I think, know something about how we manage projects. If you were builders, or I, sh I shouldn't say builders, if you were property investors and you invested in a property, um, who would be responsible for managing the construction of the building? What title would we give that person? Project manager. Is that an important role? So why do we need a project manager? Isn't it true that the carpenters know carpentry and the plumbers know plumbing and the electricians know electrics? Don't they all know their trades? They don't always turn up, true, but is that why we have a project manager? Ah, okay. Okay, so now we're starting to angle at the primary, the number one prerequisite that we have to have in place for division of labor not to cause chaos. The number one thing that we have to have in place 
is, or the number one thing that we have to do is to centralize scheduling. Centralized scheduling. So in a project environment, we do that by adding a project manager. You guys are absolutely correct. The reason we add a project manager is, is, not to sh is not because we need someone to show the carpenter how to do carpentry or the plumber how to plumb. The reason we add a project manager is that absent a project manager, what would happen? We'd have chaos. We'd have the carpenter hanging the walls before the electrics were in place. Now, what if we tried to, what if we looked at our project environment? No project manager, just a bunch of skilled tra tradespeople, but the, but the performance of the project environment is pretty god awful. You know, there's walls going up without plumbing and electrics in place, and they're having to be torn back down again, and there's conflict between, you know. And what if we said, well, we need some way to improve the functioning of this environment? Let's somehow figure out, figure out a way to tie these people's productivity to their hip pocket. Let's pay them on a piece rate. So each time you bolt a beam in place, you get 10 bucks. Each time you install a length of cable, you get $3. Each time you plumb a tap, you get $8, whatever the case is. And what if we designed our whole project environment such that each worker was paid on a piece rate where the rate corresponded with a unit of work done? Okay, are they all motivated? What can you tell me about the functioning of that environment now? Has it got better? They're in more of a hurry. It's got worse. Because if we're compensating our plumber to plumb taps, he's going to be plumbing taps even if there's nothing to plumb them to. The sink's going to be plumbed up, but absent the sink. you know. So that's exactly the wrong direction to be going in. If you think about it, piece rate pay is has been eliminated in manufacturing over the last 50 odd years. Okay, the central problem when we apply division of labor is how do we synchronize everyone? Not how do we maximize everyone's rate of work. The maximizing individual rate of work is antagonistic to the synchronization of the team. So in the case of the carpenter, we don't need him to speed up, we need him to slow down and wait till the electrics and the plumbing are installed and then hang the wall. It is worth more for us for the carpenter to stand there and do nothing than it is for him to pull out his toolkit and start banging the wall in place. Make sense? If we have a choice between those two activities, we would rather he does nothing. He's adding value by standing idle. So for this reason, we need a central scheduler. A single individual who, marches, who, who, who beats the drum to which all of the other resources work. If we don't centralize scheduling, we will have chaos. So in a production environment, in production environments, this was the first lesson that had to be learned. Now, you're all familiar with Henry Ford and the innovation that he was responsible for, at least the first application of, was the assembly line. Now, I'm sure um, there are more than one reasons for the significance of the assembly line. And certainly one of the benefits of the assembly line is the assembly line enabled the workers to stand still and it moved the work to the workers. But the real benefit, to my mind the most significant benefit of the assembly line is it forces all of the workers to work at the same speed. An assembly line is a way of synchronizing the team. The, the line itself can only run at the speed at which the slowest worker can work. So an assembly line in, in Henry Ford's environment, or the Kanban cards in a just-in-time environment, is analogous to a project manager in a project environment. So the number one thing that we need whenever we apply division of labor is to centralize scheduling. We need one person who beats the drum to which everyone marches. Now how does this apply to sales? Let's imagine a fictitious scenario. We have a salesperson who's motivated. He's paid on a piece rate. We'll call him Bob. And Bob has a conscientious manager. And Bob's manager does a time and motion study and concludes it doesn't make sense for Bob to be writing proposals. This is not a good use of Bob's time. Bob should be selling, not writing proposals. So Bob's manager goes to engineering and gets engineering to take responsibility for writing proposals, which, of course, they're better qualified to do than Bob. 
And then management goes back to Bob and says, Bob, from this point forth, you no longer write proposals. You get an RFP, a request for proposal, from the market, you deliver it to engineering, they write the proposal, then you go out and present it. Fair call? So Bob goes out and he performs his first appointment for a new week. And he goes and meets with Sally, and Sally says, I like the way you talk. You know, I like your references and your concepts. Can you give me a proposal? So Bob gets to test a new system out. He goes back to engineering at the end of the day, and he says to engineering, I've got an RFP. When can I have it? Engineering says Wednesday. Fair enough. So Bob gets on the phone. He calls Sally, and he says, Sally, I'm going to come by Wednesday and run through the proposal with you. Now, you know what's going to happen here, don't you? Yeah. Bob goes to engineering Wednesday morning to grab the proposal to go and present to Sally. Where is it? It's not done. Why didn't engineering do Bob's proposal? I think, yeah, you could say because they're lazy SOBs. But let's assume that engineering cares. If we had a caring engineering team, is that sufficient to ensure that Bob's proposal is going to be done? No. So they may not care, but let's assume they do. It's still not going to be done. Why isn't it going to be done? Let's expand our focus a little. Let's assume that Bob isn't the only salesperson. There's Bob, and there's Henry, and there's Juliet. They all are following the same mandate given to Bob. They're all out there talking to customers, saying, when would you like the proposal? Now, when you say to a potential customer, when would you like the proposal, what do they always say? ASAP, tomorrow. Everyone needs everything ASAP. So we have three or four salespeople out in the field asking clients when they'd like their proposal. All of their clients say ASAP. The salespeople go back and dump those proposals in engineering. On paper, mathematically, mathematically, engineering has the capacity to do all of, the, all of those proposals. Ma uh, management was careful enough to check that. But does, do in this in does in this instance engineering have the capacity to do all of those proposals within the lead times promised by Bob, Juliet, and absolutely not. We know that the inflow of proposals is going to be lumpy. Okay, So that's why Bob's proposal is going to be delivered late. Is Bob going to be that surprised that his proposal is delivered late? No. He's got good enough instinct. He's been around the block a few times. He's got good enough instinct to know that the proposal is not going to be done. Okay, But it's important we recognize why the proposal is not going to be done. What's mid Now, this is a very, very simple instance of division of labor. We have two people. Okay, We've split the workflow into only two pieces, generating the proposal and everything else. But already we have problems. What's the missing ingredient? Now, nah, forget communication. That's just pointing the finger at Bob or at engineering. This is a design problem. What has management done wrong? We're missing something. What was the first prerequisite? Centralized scheduling. What should have happened? Let me tell you what should have happened. We should have had a person responsible for the engineering department, a scheduler. Okay. We should have said to Bob and to Juliet and to Henry, when you go out in the field, you get an RFP. However, you do not promise a delivery date. You say to the client, when would you like it? But you don't promise a delivery date. You bring the proposal back and you give it to the estimating coordinator, let's call this person the scheduler, and the scheduler determines a delivery date, communicates that delivery date to both Bob and the client and as a consequence, smooths out the flow of proposals so that engineering can deliver them via, within the quoted delivery times. Is that a difficult problem to solve? No. No, you could say, well, customers don't like that, but that's a really a go-nowhere proposition because what you're proposing is that we tell them lies to keep them happy in the short term. In the long term, they're not going to like it unless we do what we obviously need to do in centralize scheduling. So in the most simple scenario that I could possibly imagine, two activities, two people, the first thing we need is a centralized scheduler. Make sense? Now, our sales environments are going to get significantly more complicated than that because we're not just proposing taking away proposals from Bob, are we? You've got an inkling of where this is going. We want Bob out there spending 100% of his time selling, appointment after appointment after appointment. We know that his capacity, we discussed it already, is four business development appointments a week. I would like Bob to be spending 100% of his available capacity face-to-face -face with 
potential or existing customers. That means everything that Bob is now doing other than business development appointments is going to be done by someone else. So our environment is going to get significantly more complex than Bob in engineering. We're going to have Bob out there in the field selling. We're going to have a promotions team generating the sales opportunities. We're going to have clerical people who are doing all the clerical work. We're going to have technical experts who are doing sales engineering, and so on and so on and so on. Okay, so we're staring complexity in the face here. The second requirement when we apply division of labor is we must standardize workflows. Okay, and this one's pretty obvious. Now, manufacturers don't use the term workflow, they use the term routing. And I actually prefer routing to workflow because a routing is more than a workflow. A routing is like a, a, um, a um, what's it called in, like a Gantt chart or work, work breakdown structure in a project management environment. Because a routing describes not just the path that, that work in progress follows through activities, it also describes the path that work follows through resources. So it actually maps the path of work in progress through the plant, taking into account what activity is going to be performed and who is going to perform it. Now, in a manufacturing environment, what standardized workflows means is that if we, ha is that if we have two similar products or two identical products, those products follow exactly the same routing. They follow exactly the same path through the plant. That's where our efficiencies come from. Absent centralized, uh, standardized workflows, we can't harvest those economies of the, the, the division of labor promises. Now, this is an interesting one because we're all, at least informally, students of the Industrial Revolution. And the reason I know this to be true, if I grab anyone, even a, even a, a high school student, um, or worse still, an MBA graduate, and give them... <laughs> and give them a piece of, uh, or not even give them anything, give them a mandate, go and improve the performance of that work environment over there, what's the very first thing they're going to do? They're going to get a sharp pencil and a piece of graph paper, and they're going to, or Visio nowadays, they're going to map it. It's almost instinctive. Even people who don't have formal business training, they go and they map it. And then the, the thing that comes after mapping is, standardize. The whole purpose of mapping it is to standardize it. So we're going to map what happens, raw material into finished products, and remember I could be talking about a knowledge work environment here. And then we're going to look at the workflow to make sure it makes sense, get rid of any obvious inefficiencies, uh, unproductive running around, that's what Lean's all about. And then we're going to mandate that on every iteration of this workflow, work in progress follows exactly the same routing from start to finish. Okay. The assumption is that that in and of itself is going to increase the productivity of the work environment. The little recognized um, reality is that it doesn't necessarily. Or if it does, the increase in productivity is minimal. If we were to go and find a traditional artisan, let's say a violin maker, and we were to map his workflow, and then we were to standardize it and say, in future, Terry, I'd like you to make every violin following exactly this workflow. Do we have any reason to expect that we're going to see a big, big increase in productivity? No, we don't. So the only time we're going to see a big increase in productivity is if Terry is incompetent. But we have to assume he's not. And where sales is concerned, we would have to assume that your managers wouldn't employ incompetent salespeople. I mean, if that's what the problem is, it's easy, easily fixed. Okay, so standardizing workflows in and of itself is not going to provide you the significant improvement that you're looking for. Now, there's a reason I'm laboring this point. And the reason is that many of your organizations have gone out and invested a lot of money in a fairly expensive piece of technology, sales-related technology. What's it called? CRM. The promise of CRM is it's going to increase sales. <laughs> How is it going to increase sales? What mechanism is CRM going to use to cause that increase in sales? Huh? Standardization. There's two promises. It provides access to information. But that's bollocks. 
your salespeople have access to information already. Has, ha, you can't tell me that no one's ever heard of a day timer or a Franklin a piece of paper. They already have access to information. And the reality is your salespeople, for the most part, are running the jobs that they sell. You don't have an access to information problem in a traditional sales environment because the salesperson is involved in bloody everything. The mechanism that CRM vendors claim that they are going to bring to the table to cause a massive increase in productivity, at least significant enough to pay for the extraordinary cost of CRM, is standardization. We get all these people marching to exact or following exactly the same routing, we're going to see a big increase in sales. Now, we don't see a big increase in sales when we plug in the CRM, do we? Never. Well, why would we expect to see an increase in sales? If we force the violin maker to follow exactly the same procedure, we're not going to see more violins either. It was a dumb idea to start with. Now, that's not to say there's not value in standardization. It's not to say there's not value in the CRM. There is value in standardization, but the value in standardization exists if and only if you intend to apply division of labor. If you don't intend to apply division of labor, you do not need a CRM. All it does is imposes an unnecessary overhead on salespeople and provides management with the false impression that they have access to meaningful data. Okay. The third requirement here is that we need to formalize management. Now I'm playing with words. It would be more correct to simply say we need management. Do any of you have sales managers in your firms? Okay. I think what you mean is you have people whose business cards contain letters so arranged as to read sales manager. You don't actually have sales managers if yours is a typical sales environment. And the reason you don't is that your salespeople operate autonomously. And I suspect if we look at it, there's ample evidence of the fact that salespeople operate autonomously. Is that a fair call? We tell them to be autonomous. We pay them to be autonomous. We make a big fuss about the fact that they're held accountable only for bottom line results. So if salespeople operate autonomously, what is the role of a manager? You, you have this hapless individual and you write sales manager on their business card. What do you actually expect them to do? Do you actually expect them to manage? People say to me, oh, well, Justin, you're suggesting that our managers micromanage. We have our managers managing outcomes. Now, what a load of rubbish. How do you manage outcomes? That's what we call an oxymoron. Managing outcomes is not managing at all. There's a word already for managing outcomes. We don't have to get cute with the English language. The word that already exists for managing outcomes is called spectating. <laughs> Micromanaging is called management. Everything else is called not managing. Okay, You do not have sales managers currently. You have hapless individuals who are unfortunate enough to have sales manager written on their business card, but the environment over which they preside is designed in such a way as to make management impossible. Okay, So I'm not pointing my finger at these individuals. I'm pointing my finger at guess who? Whoever designed the environment. We have no business putting sales managers in place. Okay, But guess what happens in this environment? We apply division of labor. We standardize workflows. We have specialists performing specialist tasks. All of a sudden, we have a requirement for management. And we don't have a requirement for the kind of management that your hapless managers are engaged in. We have a requirement for proper management, objective management, management by numbers. So we're talking about putting your sales managers in a position where they have access to current and accurate data and where they have control. So what ends up happening is the person who owns the schedule answers to the manager. The manager's primary responsibility is the upkeep of the schedule, looking after the scheduling piece. Okay, The scheduling piece is where work allocation decisions are made. So in an environment where we apply division of labor, management now has control over who does what and when. And management also has, for reasons I'll explain shortly, access to accurate and current data. 
So in a situation where an individual has data and control, they are now in a position where they can manage. Now, I know this is tough for, for, for you, me, insulting your sales managers the way that I just have, but does anyone want to argue the point? Are they really managers in the current environment, in the true sense of the word management? I have sales managers come to these presentations, and I say, do you have control over your sales team? And they say, yes. I say, well, describe how you control your sales team. And they describe what they do. They say, we put them in a room, and we tell them to do stuff. And do they do it? No. Do you expect them to do it? Well, no, actually. <laughs> so they don't actually put them in a room and tell them to do stuff. They beg them to attend a meeting, which sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. But on the occasion that they do, the managers beseech them to do stuff without any real expectation that their requests or commandments, if they're brash enough to make them, are actually going to be actioned. Fair call? Cool? OK. But this is not how things look in production. If you go to in a production environment and the bell rings at 8 o'clock and there's a factory whip meeting, lasts for 15 minutes, the whole team gets together and they review the list of jobs that are in the red and they make decisions uh, as opposed to what's going to happen for each of those jobs. Does the production manager at the end of that meeting have a reasonable expectation that those actions are going to be actioned? Yes, they do. Wouldn't that be magic to be a sales manager and actually believe that you had control over the sales function? Okay, So this is what we're promising, and it sounds kind of nice. The problem is that most sales managers have no experience managing. They have a lot of experience of lobbying, politicking, playing amateur psychologist, and spectating, but they don't have a lot of experience managing. So we need to help your sales managers to step up to the plate and become managers in an intelligent sense of the word management. Okay. So what I want to do now, we've talked about the theory, is pause to see if any of you have any objections to this whole division of labor thing, or any fundamental objections to the theory. And then we're going we're gonna to look at each of the components of the solution that I'm proposing in order. Division of labor, uh, centralized scheduling, standardized workflows and a formal approach to management, and look at building a new approach to the sales function literally on a clean sheet of paper. Okay, And then we're going to test our claim, the claim that I made at the beginning of today's presentation, that we can realistically expect to double the volume of new business transactions without increasing operating expense. Okay, so, objections or concerns about the theory? Yeah, good. So this is a common objection. So salespeople say to me, Justin, you don't understand sales because sales is actually complex. We're dealing with complexity. And of course, the whole idea of applying division of labor in an environment that we have complexity is fought with problems. And I agree with them, it is fought with problems. But that's not what we're debating here. We're not debating, is it difficult or not? What we're quest The question that we're asking is, is it possible? So let me put it to you. Is it possible to take a complex environment and apply division of labor? Ever been to the US? No? You should go to the US. Yeah. If you come to the US, I'll buy you a coffee. One of the things you want to do in the US, aside from having coffee with me, is go to Seattle and go to the Boeing plant. And in the Boeing plant right now, I think they're assembling 787s, the Dreamliners. I didn't see them assembling. I don't know what they were assembling when I was there, but it's a magical, magical place to visit. You know, there's like 23,000 people on a shift working in the one building, biggest building on Earth. You can see it from the moon. But yeah, that's all nice. But but what's my point? My point is, one of those aircraft is on a scale of complexity that, that goes from simple to really, really complex. Where does it sit on the scale? Really, really complex. So if the salesperson's default assumption that more complex things need to be done by individuals is true, it would follow that the plane was built by just a geezer with a spanner. He'd crawl around and put the whole thing together. But it's not. They have a team of people. Okay. So 
you're correct in identifying the fundamental challenge. You know, in a complex environment, you know, the, the, there's engineering required to make it work properly. But here's the interesting point. Hang on a sec. Let's imagine that we had, we had two environments, and we'll stick with aerospace. We had two production environments. In one production environment, we were building hang gliders. We were assembling hang gliders. And in the other environment, we were assembling 747s. And we had just one project manager. You know, there'd been an earthquake, and they'd all dropped in a hole. We had just one left. Which of the environments would we assign the project manager to? Ah, oh, the complex one. OK. So I'm suggesting we apply exactly the same logic for exactly the same reason in a sales environment. When we get into talking about the practical implication, we'll talk about how do we make handoffs work. The trick with handoffs is we need to differentiate between those situations where handoffs are possible and can therefore occur, and those situations where handoffs are impossible and therefore should not occur. One of the big problems in sales, particularly engineer to order environments, is when we apply division of labor carelessly, we expect salespeople to hand off things that they rightfully should not be handing off. And I'm going to get to this if I have time in a minute. I'm going to show you why. If you have a salesperson take a brief for a complex product or service, it is impossible for that salesperson to hand off the brief to someone else. Now, if it's impossible for the salesperson to hand off the brief, then the salesperson should not hand off the brief. So I'm going to talk to you, how, uh, talk to you about how, in that situation, we need to ensure that the salesperson does not take the brief in the first place. Because if we let him take it and then ask him to hand it off, we're going to have a mess. Okay? These problems can be reconciled, but you're correct in identifying the importance of them. Well, we need to be careful with the, we need to be careful with the, word, the whole word relationship. Um, the, the, problem, the problem with salespeople's usage of the word relationship is when salespeople use the term relationship, in most cases they're referring to personal relationships. I love relationships, but I'm in business and you're in business, so when people are talking about relationships, I assume what people are talking about are commercial relationships. Yeah, but let me, let me come back and focus. Yeah, sorry? The, the relationship one is an important point because for the most part, you and your organizations are not selling personal relationships. Okay, And if personal relationships are critical to what you're selling, you probably need to you know, question whether that makes sense. Okay, In some cases, organizations are selling personal relationships, but that is problematic. You know, Each one of your salespeople is not an asset in that case. They're a contingent liability. Yeah. The whole relationship notion is oversold. You don't sell relationships, you sell products and services. And if you do a good job of delivering them, you end up with a relationship. Okay? In most cases, the relationship is not the antecedent to the sale. Okay? And if you separate salespeople from the processing of transactions, the whole discussion becomes moot anyway. What ends up happening is that customers develop a close working relationship with the customer service team who are processing transactions after the initial sale. And then salespeople, are no, their job is no longer to build relationships that never should have been in the first place. Their job is to sell. Now, if you think customers really want relationships, then answer me this. How much of a premium are your customers prepared to pay for the personal relationship? Are they prepared to pay 10% more, 20% more? The truth is they would like to pay less. Oh, but I've got a relationship with you, Bob. Therefore, I should pay less. Okay? It's a go-nowhere proposition. We need to forget about relationships and focus on making sales. And then delivering so as to satisfy customers' expectations and retain them. Okay? These people are in business for the most part. They don't want relationships. They've got enough friends. Okay? Other questions or objections? Oh, 
Uh, scheduler. scheduler. Yeah, so let, the, here's my favorite example to address this question. Let's imagine we have a rowboat. Let's imagine we have four rowboats and we have four oarsmen in the rowboat, rowers or whatever you want to call them. And we do a race, and we calculate, we, we calculate the time by adding up, summing up the time of all the, the oarsmen and then dividing them by the number of oarsmen. So, you know, in, in that situation, each oarsman rows as fast as possible. Okay. Let's, let's imagine a situation, though, where we apply division of labor. We take all of the oarsmen out of their own boats and put them in the one boat. So we now have four oarsmen sitting in a line. Okay. We blow a whistle. What does each oarsman have to do in order to maximize the speed of the boat now? Row at the speed of the slowest oarsman. Okay. Do we need a scheduler in the boat to cause four oarsmen to row in time? Well, well, it's, well, it's an interesting point. Before we get to the coxswain, the answer to the question is, well, actually, no. If we put four kids in a boat, to begin with, they'll start rowing like crazy, and oars will clash, and they'll capsize a couple of times, but they'll figure out quite quickly, in short order, that it makes sense to row in time. Now, in that context, it's quite easy for them to row in time with one another because they're operating in very close proximity. They can see each other, they can hear each other, they can see the consequence of the actions of their colleagues. They can see the work in progress, where in this point, the work in progress is the ocean that's been rowed. Yeah. But what happens is, if we separate them, they lose the ability to self-synchronize because they're no longer operating in close proximity to one another. So when we grew, when industry grew from the craft shop to the modern industrial complex, that proximity was severed. But the reality is, if we're serious about rowing really, really fast, guess what we do anyway? We stick a coxswain in the front of the boat who beats a drum or clackers, bangs clackers at the speed at the, which the slowest, and then everyone rows in time with the... Hmm. So the answer is yes, but if you're serious about speed, you're going to end up with a schedule anyway. Okay. So, oh, any more? Yeah. I like what you said so far about the vision of labor. And I can see it particularly on the Western side. So what I wouldn't mind when you go through the example of taking some board, and that's if, in my circumstance, working for a smaller company, startup, yeah. uh, taking a new product to market, so I'm doing product sales marketing role, so it's a yeah. How do you divide labor tasks without blowing budget? Okay, so uh, I'm going to show you the ideal model, and then I'm going to show you how you apply it in a small business. Okay, and I'm going to argue that you have to apply it in a small business, because if you don't, you're just going to stay small. So this discussion is actually more critical to you if you're in a small enterprise than you are if you're in a big enterprise. Uh, big enterprises can get away with being extraordinarily inefficient because they have slack built in everywhere. Any other objections or questions? Good, let's move. And by the way, if you need to eat more, grab a drink, just there's heaps of food over there, just jump up and grab it and sit back down again. Okay? So, we have four subjects that we need to discuss. The first is division of labor. So what I want to talk about is what does division of labor mean in practice? If we're going to transition from an environment where the salesperson is responsible for the entire environment to an environment where the salesperson has limited responsibility, ideally is only responsible for performing sales appointments, who does what? Okay. So. A nice way to do this exercise is to make a list of everything that salespeople do today. Okay, what do your salespeople do today, or what does a typical salesperson do today? Okay, so make them or do them. Both. So let's separate those. Appointment setting. And the other thing they do is appointments. Now, are all appointments equal? I think we need to draw a distinction between what I want to call business development appointments and between other, other appointments. What would the other appointments consist of? Go, going back to visit existing customers to scoop up the orders that they probably would have rung in anyway. Account management, doing customer service, knowledge gathering perhaps. They can gather the knowledge when they're selling as far as I'm concerned, but yeah, they might be doing that. We won't sell today, we'll just go and gather knowledge. 
Good on you, Bob. Yeah. <laughs> so appointments, we got biz dev. And then we've got appointments. I'm going to use a general term that we like to use with our salespeople. I'm going to use the term account management to refer to all the other appointments. I hate the term account management. And I hate terms that are non-specific, that are deliberately vague and ambiguous, like relationship and marketing and account management. But I'm going to use it because in most cases, I think organizations choose to call their salespeople account managers because they want the term to be vague and the reality is they've loaded up this hapless individual with a whole bunch of activities they couldn't possibly perform concurrently. So we call them an account manager. It makes it sound, sound like you know, we're doing the right thing. I know, this is very funny. <laughs> what, um, what else are salespeople doing? It's very funny because we're talking about John's organization here. <laughs> They're doing what, sorry? They're doing CRM. So let's, they're, typing, they're typing in your CRM, and they love it too. But let's, that's, a clerical, that's a clerical activity. So let's just have a generic category here called clerical. OK, generating quotes. So quote, generation. Now, do they just generate the quote, or do they also design the solution? Most, in technical sales environments, a lot of times salespeople design the solution. We've worked in organizations where salespeople literally come back to the office and fire up AutoCAD and literally design the solution. Okay? What else are salespeople doing? Yeah, that's business development appointments. Order taking, yeah, let's call, let's, let's, I'm going to suggest we have an entry here that we call customer service. And that covers taking repeat orders and handling problems and issues and so on. So let's say customer service. What else do salespeople do? Yeah, we've got that. Business development meetings and account management meetings. Internal, okay, let's ignore the meta activities, the attending meetings, going to the bathroom, and all that other stuff, yeah? In the pursuit of sales, what else do they do? A lot of driving, a lot of travel, yeah? So? Cu yeah, that's customer service. There's another one that I want to put up here. Not because it's significant uh, in terms of the quantum of time, but because it's significant for other reasons, and that is follow-up calls. Do you ever find your salespeople in the office instead of out in the field, and you say, what are they doing? They say, oh, I'm following up. You ever have that? Research, yeah. And um, what about, do any of you sell technical stuff? Eng stuff that has to be custom engineered? What do salespeople end up doing during the delivery co uh, um, component? Interfering. Interfering? <laughs> helping or helping. What do they call it? They call it project management, don't they? So what do we have here? I was writing RE. Do you remember what RE stood for? Research. Research. And let's say project management. OK, so I'm alleging that your salespeople should be doing nothing other than sell. So here's what happens. We add some resources on the right-hand side. The first one we're going to add is salesperson. And we're going to draw a line between the salesperson and the activity we'd like this person to perform, which is Business development appointments. There we go. Now, that's what this person does, business development appointments. Everything else, I'm suggesting, gets done by someone else. So we're going to go through each of these activities and figure out who's going to do them. And you're going to argue with me about why it doesn't make sense or why it's flat out not possible for anyone other than the salesperson to do these activities. Now, we probably have to draw a line between travel and the salesperson too, because it's a little difficult for someone else to travel on the salesperson's behalf. So I'll give you that one. OK. Appointment setting. Who should set appointments? Well, I like the idea of someone other than the 
from doing it, but I really don't like the idea of a telemarketer doing it. Because that whole approach, really, between you and me, completely sucks or blows. Same thing, different direction of movement. But either way, there's a lot of, yeah. Okay, so if you show me a situation where salespeople have appointments generated for them by telemarketers, I'll show you a situation where salespeople really aren't appreciative. You know, it's not a good way of generating. So I said before that salespeople aren't good at generating sales opportunities. One of the reasons salespeople aren't good at generating sales opportunities is left to their own devices, they do exactly what, pro what telemarketers do. They just telemarket. They get on the phone and they ring people and it's highly ineffective. Okay? Anyone heard of inbound marketing? It's the new catchphrase for convincing people to approach you. This is what you need to do if you want your salespeople to be engaged with reasonable quality opportunities. If your salespeople had a choice between going and visiting an opportunity where the opportunity was initiated by the potential client or initiated by the telemarketer, which would they rather? Okay, so appointment setting. We started with the most difficult one of all. In most cases, and certainly when we're talking about a telemarketer or a salesperson doing their own prospecting, what happens is they bundle together two activities that really should be discrete. One activity is, the prom is promotion. Promotion is the generation of a sales opportunity. And the other activity is the setting of it, the telephone call to set the appointment. Okay? In my world, those two activities need to be separated so that one specialist sells the prospect on the idea of having a meeting and then someone else schedules it. So here's my question, if, and I'll show you how in a minute. If we can successfully sell a prospect on having a meeting with someone from your organization, how difficult is it to schedule it? Do we need a salesperson to schedule it? Okay, so I have a trick when I run these workshops here, and I suspect you didn't see this coming. Um, what I actually do at the end of the workshop is I make an offer, and I'll tell you what it is now, so you can ruminate, stew on it as we're talking. The offer is that if you like this stuff, I'm prepared to run a conference call with you and your management team to work through the same basic or an abridged version of this presentation and socialize these ideas with your team. Okay? Now if you're interested in that, you give me a business card at the end of the presentation, okay? and my assistant Charlene will be in contact to schedule. You know? So let's assume at the end of this meeting I get one or two business cards, or even you know, 12. Or <laughs> How difficult do you think it's going to be for Charlene to schedule those appointments? and you expect it. Can I let you in on a secret? And I hope you don't find this offensive. It's highly unlikely that Charlene, if you give me your business card, will even ring you. She lives in Chicago and we have a time zone problem. And even when my sales coordinator lived in Brisbane, she still didn't ring. Because in most cases there's no, you know, if I get someone's business card and someone says, look, I'd like to have that conference call you mentioned, Scheduling the appointment is as simple as sending an email saying which of these three possible times is going to suit you better. Okay? So, the job of your marketing department or promotions department needs to be to sell meetings. If somebody else sells the meeting, appointment setting is nothing other than scheduling. And for your promotions to be effective, the first thing you need to recognize is the requirement to separate the scheduling of the meeting from the selling of the meeting, which means no more telemarketers and no more salespeople on the phone trying to prospect. Okay? It's ineffective. So appointment setting. If the prospect has already requested an appointment, what type of person is required to schedule it? It's a clerical task, isn't it? Now it's maybe a high level clerical task. There are levels of clerical people. We go from a, like a data entry person all the way up to an executive assistant. What we're talking about in this situation is probably someone who's right at the top, an executive assistant. But for the moment, I don't want to let the cat out of the bag, so I'm just going to call this role here clerical. Okay? And appointment scheduling, if promotions has done its job properly, is clerical. Now we've added a clerical person to the sales function. So what we should do is look up and down the list and see if there are any other activities here that are also clerical. Clerical, clerical. yeah. Sure. 
Do you have an MBA? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Clerical is certainly clerical. So by that we mean data entry into the CRM, literature fulfillment, etc., etc. Quote generation. Quote generation. Um, probably not. So there's really three levels of quotes. There's typing some numbers into a system and pressing print. There's taking some specs, looking them up on tables and, and organizing a price. And then there's designing a solution and estimating it. So the first level a clerical person could do, but, but we're probably not going to have them do it because there's someone better to do it. But I'll get to that in a second. In a very small organization, yes, we might have the clerical person do the quoting. Okay. What else is clerical? Research. Research is clerical. Yeah. Go to the web page and collect three or four basic factoids and stick them in the appointment event in Outlook. That's your pre-call planning done. It's significantly more than what most capable salespeople do. Incapable salespeople do significantly more than that, but that's only to try and justify their existence. They can say, well, I didn't sell anything, but I did a huge amount of research. Um, so where are we? Research is clerical, correct. What else is clerical? The booking of travel is clerical, isn't it? So actually travel can be shared between the salesperson who actually has to do the flying and the clerical person who schedules it. And the same applies to expense tracking and so on. Um, Follow-up calls. I'm suggesting... <laughs> no, you don't like this idea. You don't like this idea. And I'll tell you why you don't like this idea. Because you are aware of the fact that if we employ a clerical person, even a really good one, a person who's capable enough to qualify as an executive assistant, that person is still not going to be capable of doing what you do on the telephone when you make a follow-up call. Isn't that correct? Yeah, it's correct. That's why we don't want you doing the follow-up call. Because we don't want that done on the phone. If there is selling to be done and you are a field-based salesperson, we want you to get in your little car and drive out into the suburbs and sit face-to-face -face with that prospect and do your damn job. <laughs> so, someone else is going to schedule the call and the person who schedules the call is not going to have the ability to get involved in the sales discussion. Because if we've gone to the trouble of employing a $100,000 a year field-based salesperson, we want that critter out in the field selling. We don't want him on the telephone talking. Yeah? So we want to separate. Remember, we standardize the workflow. We want to separate the scheduling activities from the performance of activities. Now, let me tell you, I've only told you half the story. Let me tell you, let's reverse back up and I'll tell you the beginning of this story. The fact that it's a follow-up call means you've already engaged with this prospect. So you went to a meeting and you pitched to them. But it's a complex sale, so you didn't have the ability to ask for the order at that first meeting. Yeah, so there's other activities. So what should happen at the first meeting? You should be selling up to... You should be selling up to the next activity. The next activity. So if I go and meet with someone for the first time, it's called a best practice briefing. That's just what we call it. And we think it's really cute. You know? Don't you think it's cute? Best practice briefing? So other people don't like it, so we call their meetings a capability showcase meeting. But I like best practice briefing. Okay, so I go and I do the best practice briefing, and my objective at the best practice briefing is to sell an executive briefing. And I tell my prospects at the beginning, my objective is to sell an executive briefing. So we're going to work through this together. If it makes sense, we're going to schedule an executive briefing. If not, we're going to abandon the opportunity, and we'll talk again, but only socially. Until that point in time where you recognize you want to invite me back in. Okay, that's the deal at that first meeting. So at the end of the first meeting, the salesperson asks for permission to schedule the... Executive briefing. So do you then say I'll get my person? Of course. So when I ask the question of you, Peter, can, uh, can we go ahead and schedule an executive briefing, how many possible answers to that question are there? Three. Yes, no, or maybe. maybe. And maybe means I'll tell you later. None of those answers require you to make the follow-up call. Yes means I'll get my assistant to schedule it. No means, well, maybe I'll see you at the pub on Friday night. Thanks for letting me in. And maybe means, well, I'll have my assistant follow up to get the final answer. And if it's yes, then she'll book the appointment. And I look forward to seeing Yeah. So what happens when we get rid of the follow up calls is A, salespeople stay in the field where we want them. And B, we put salespeople in a situation where in those initial appointments, they actually have to sell. 
They actually have to sell. Every appointment has an objective and every appointment has a closing question at the end. Mr. Prospect, do you have my permission to have my assistant schedule an executive briefing? Solution design workshop, whatever the case is. Yes, no, or maybe. Okay, so you're correct. A clerical person performing follow-up calls will not work the way the sales function is currently structured, but we don't like the way the sales function is currently structured. We're going to rip it apart and rebuild it, and in the new build, we now have a clear division between scheduling and selling. Okay? Is this exciting or what? Oh. Okay, so let's look down the list. What other specialists do we need? Oh. Appointments. The second type of appointment we call account management. If account management generally includes business development, but we take business development out, what's left? Processing repeat orders and handling problems. What do we call those? Customer service. Now the, the sad thing is, and this is really sad, and a lot of organizations we work with, they have a customer service department and it makes me want to cry. If, the, if, 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 if it was possible to give organizations a reward for dehumanizing and mistreating people, you, you know, the, uh, the, the, the customer service departments in most organizations would be so designed as to ensure that management would get for themselves a gold medal to put on their mantelpieces. So what happens with customer service is we employ these individuals, we say to them, you're responsible for customer service, and then we print salespeople's cell phone numbers on their business cards. And who do you think c customers ring when they have a customer service issue? Salespeople. Salespeople. Okay, so then we have conflicts between customers and customer service, and between customer service and salespeople, you know, if you're going to have a customer service department, and you should, these people should be responsible for customer service. So here's what happens. We add customer service. And in your cases, it might just be just one person. And account management. Most of that is actually customer service. It's processing repeat transactions. I'll draw a dotted line. What else is customer service here? Uh, how about customer service? You missed that one, Peter. <laughs> it should be the most important thing. Let me tell you a secret. When we work with organizations, particularly manufacturers, everyone assumes, including the client, that we're going to go in there and on day one build a brand spanking, shiny new sales function. Let me tell you what we do in actuality on day one. We fix customer service. We say to our manufacturing clients, we start at the factory door and we work backwards. Promotions is the last thing that we do. When we go and engage with organizations, Rome is burning and they're running ads. <laughs> and they're saying, can you help us write better ads? Well, why aren't your existing customers repurchasing? Well, because we deliver stuff late. Okay, so we start at the factory door and we work backwards. Running ads is the last thing we do and in most cases we simply never run ads because if your customer service is good and your production is good and you deliver within promised delivery times then your customers come back and give you more business. Okay, So you're absolutely correct. Customer service should get top billing. What else is customer service here? Oh, quote generation. So if you have a customer service function, it makes sense to take quotes and give them to customer service. Okay? Good. So we have a salesperson. Yeah, because quotes are generally... Yeah. Who else would do quotes? So get them qualified. Teach them how to, yeah. I mean, what use are they to you if they're not capable of doing a quote? In, mo in, in most of, yeah, in most of our cases, in most organizations we work with, they're sort of semi-technical. 
but, but capable enough to do a quote. Maybe not capable enough to design a complex solution, but certainly capable enough to put the quote together, to look up the parts in ERP and add them up and add the tax and so on. Yeah, they can do that. If they don't, they shouldn't be working for you. You should confiscate their little headsets and send them out to drive taxis or something. Yeah, so we separated here solution design from quotes, and we're going to talk about solution design now, I think. So we've, we've got customer service. Let's look down the list. What have, what's the first thing that we're going to... Oh, solution design. Who should do solution design? Engineering should do solution design. Who should not do solution design? Now, we've already discovered why the salesperson shouldn't do solution design. I think it was... What's your name, sorry? David. It was you who put your finger on this, wasn't it? The, or maybe it was Peter. Or one of the two of you... Maybe Peter. Let, let me show you why salespeople should not do solution design. And that's not all salespeople shouldn't do. Okay? So let's talk now for just five minutes about a complex sales environment, a technical sales environment. Can we talk about that? Who were here works in a technical sales environment? Engineer to order. You design something at the same time you're selling it. Okay? So in a simple sales environment, in other words, not engineer to order, we can structure the environment so it looks like this. We have sales. And for those of you who are in engineer to order environments, you can forget everything else you learned today. This, in isolation, is sufficient to pay for your gas here. So we have sales and we have production. In a simple sales environment, we can have them end to end like this and with a handoff in between. So a simple sales environment, let's say Coca-Cola. The rep goes out in the field, follows a route, goes from store to store. In each store, the rep does a stock take. So she counts the cartons and cans and so on and um, builds an order, shows it to the storekeeper. The storekeeper signs the screen and she hits send and it gets dispatched to production. What does the rep do next? Go to the next job. Does she ring production and say, did you get the order? Does she ring production and say, did you understand the order? Does she ring production and say, can you tell me when the order's on the loading dock so I can come and check it prior to dispatch? <laughs> no, the rep is comfortable that if her order contained the words five cartons of lemonade, then five cartons of lemonade at some point are going to be delivered to that. Yeah? So this model works perfectly. Yeah, this, so this division of labor works perfectly. Correct. But what happens if it's an engineer to order environment? Does this work very well? No. no. Because the reason it doesn't work well is that the order is no longer unambiguous. Five cartons of lemonade is unambiguous. You can parse, whichever direction you parse that sentence in, there's no ambiguity. Lemonade is lemonade. If it's green, it's not lemonade, you know? But when we have a complex sales environment, Blue means what? Blue means dark or light or what shade or okay, so you have a Pantone book, but a Pantone book examined under what light source? You know, there's shades of everything. You know, and in most cases it's not just as simple as blue. The clients come to you with a problem and you have to invent a solution. And there's all sorts of constraints that you have to invent with respect to, you know. So there's trade-offs, multiple trade-offs associated with all of the decisions that you're making, you know. So the person, inevitably, who takes the customer's brief has to be involved all the way through production. Because all the way through production, production has questions. And those questions, in order to be answered, require the person answering them to be intimate with what was sold. Okay, so in a technical sales environment, here's what we end up with. Very cool. We end up with these two dovetailing. Salespeople end up being involved in production. Now the good news is that salespeople can ensure that what is delivered at least in some ways resembles that which was sold, which is good news for the organization. They might get paid and for the customer. They might buy again. But there are significant costs associated with this model. The first cost is that because the salesperson dedicates so much capacity to production, when they're in production they're not selling. So what actually happens is the salesperson's capacity is reduced and they spend significantly less time in the field. 
Now, when they spend less time in the field, it's not just that they engage with fewer opportunities. If that was all that went wrong, it, you know, we could cope with that. The real problem is that when their capacity is diminished, salespeople engage in a value-destroying activity that they call qualification. What qualification means is they engage late with potential customers. They arrive late at the party. Now, salespeople and their managers have been believing for decades that qualification is a value-adding activity. And I couldn't think of anything so transparently wrong. Think of the two questions that salespeople ask to qualify their prospects. The first question they ask is, do you have a... No. It's a little less elegant than that. They say, do you have a... Budget. <laughs> and the second question they ask starts with when. Are you planning on purchasing? So some salespeople ask those questions more artfully than others, but all over the world, those are the two universal qualification questions. Do you have the budget? And when are you planning on purchasing? Now, people who answer no to either of those questions are deemed to be disqualified. So salespeople don't go and visit with them. And salespeople complain continually that they're short of qualified opportunities. Ever heard that complaint? They never, they're so, they're so truthful. They never say, boss, I'm short of opportunities. They say, boss, I'm short of qualified sales opportunities. And you think to yourself, well, that's fair enough. Mm, Qualification is obviously a value-adding activity. We don't want our salespeople calling on unqualified prospects. Or do you? Here's the thing. If your prospects only call on qualified, if your salespeople only call on qualified prospects, they are always late to the party. In other words, they only engage with potential customers when potential customers have already recognized that they have a requirement, determined the, idea, determined the nature of the solution for that re requirement, and then bid the job out to a number of vendors. And you are one of those vendors. And it's only that nature of opportunity that salespeople are prepared to recognize as qualified. So when your salespeople arrive late at the party, what happens to their conversion rate? No, it goes up. And therefore, because they engage with far fewer prospects, and the prospects they engage with are in the process of making a purchasing decision. So it's great for their conversion rate, and that validates their decision to qualify. Everyone thinks, well, you're a clever boy after all. Go ahead and qualify some more. But tell me, what happens to the margin that salespeople earn in the deals that they win? It goes down. Why does it go down? Because there's more competition. You're bidding against other vendors. What happens to the size of the deals that get sold? They go down. I'll tell you why they go down. They go down because customers are clever. And customers know that if they want to save money, which of course customers always do, the best way to save money is to project manage the job internally. So instead of subbing out a total, total solution for someone else to manage and deliver, what you want to do is chunk it down into discrete pieces and then farm the discrete pieces out across a number of vendors. Is it only in the US that, that buyers do that? Think of what's been happening in the construction industry over the years. Okay. We're seeing organizations hiring a project manager and doing the whole bloody thing themselves. Okay. So what ends up happening is conversion increases the, uh, sorry, qualification increases the conversion rate at the expense of deal size and margin. Okay. It's inevitable, though, that salespeople are going to qualify in this environment because they're so short of time. So this is hard. Just questioning early qualification, asking too, too early qualification. No, I, I tell you, I, well, you need to differentiate between prospects and non-prospects. Okay, but, but, but we need to be very careful with the word qualification because salespeople use it to mean something very, very specific. Unlike the word account management, it's not a catch-all term that means different things in different circumstances. When salespeople talk about qualification, they always mean the same thing. What they mean is, is talking, to an inbound, talking to a prospect who's made an inbound inquiry and asking them those two questions. When are you planning on purchasing and do you have a budget? Okay, my suggestion is, is that qualif qualifying so defined must be eliminated. Now, there is still a requirement to differentiate between prospects and non-prospects. If you sell SAP, it doesn't make sense for your reps to be out calling on owners of fish and chip shops. 
But guess what? That problem doesn't even exist because it's self-correcting. If you own a fish, fish and chip shop, you don't have a lot of interest in talking to the SAP rep. So if he rings, you're not going to let him come visit with you anyway. Okay? So qualification, there isn't the requirement for qualification that management thinks there is. The reality is if your salespeople do nothing other than sell, they have plenty of time. Plenty of time. The issue here is that because they're in the plant all the time, trying to hustle a job through production, they don't have time to be in the field. So they only choose, they're extraordinarily selective about, about when they're going to get in the company car and take a drive. Okay? Here's the other problem. This is the point in this model where a sale occurs in both cases. Now, do you have friction currently between sales and production? Is there, some, is there argy bargy between sales and production? There is. And there always will be. Okay? So don't even try and eliminate it. In a certain sense, friction between sales and production is healthy. Let me show you the context in which friction between sales and production is healthy. The question is, where does it occur? In this model here, where does the negotiation between sales and production commence? Uh, no, in most cases it doesn't. It should. We're going to get to that. It should. It should. But in most traditional engineer order environments, the, s the salesperson scopes up the solution, goes and presents it to production. Pretty much. Pretty much. Now, increasingly organizations, particularly technology companies, are e uh, edging towards a better solution, but it's not the ideal solution. Okay? What happens, of course, is if the salesperson arrives on the scene in production with an order, then the negotiation starts. So the argy-bargy exists right here. Now, to be negotiating what's going to be delivered at that point is in whose interest? No one. It doesn't benefit production, it doesn't benefit sales, and it certainly doesn't benefit the customer. So if you have, if your friction, if the negotiation the tension between sales and production exists post-sale, it is corrosive. Okay? So here's the new model. Here's the model we advocate. Sales is here. Okay? Production is here. So we're back to the Coca-Cola model. And we know that's not going to work. That's going to be a disaster. So here's what we do. We introduce a third person. The width of the line, by the way, doesn't indicate the quantum of time invested. Okay. So the salesperson is responsible for selling. But selling does not include designing the solution. We have production. And they're responsible if nothing changes here. And the new person we add, we're going to call a project leader. That's a term we typically use. OK, project leader. Let me tell you how the project leadership role start, works. The salesperson goes out and talks to a potential customer. Because the salesperson no longer qualifies, the salesperson is arriving early for the party. In fact, the salesperson arrives so early there isn't even a party. Okay? No one else is there. No other vendors. The customer lets the, the salesperson in because they have a vague notion that they have an itch, but they haven't yet got to the point of diagnosing it or looking for vendors or anything like that. The salesperson arrives early. I can't say it enough. They arrive early. It's terrible for their conversion rate, but who gives a toss about conversion rates? Has anyone ever figured a way to deposit conversion rates into your bank account? No, you don't bank conversion rates, you bank money. Okay, so forget your conversion rate. The salesperson engages early. The initial discussions, therefore, that the salesperson has with potential customers are conceptual in nature. They talk about the methodology you bring to the table. They talk about the types of solutions you've built in other situations, etc., etc. Okay? If those initial discussions go well, the customer at some point says, I'd like to talk turkey with you about my particular set of requirements. It's enough of the abstract, let's talk about the concrete. 
At that point, the salesperson says, because she has no choice, I need to reschedule and come back with a project leader. Now, is that inconvenient? Sure, it's inconvenient. But the way that the salesperson sells the inconvenience is she continues on to explain to the customer, the reason I want to come back with David, our project leader, is that David is an expert in this type of situation. The minute the salesperson says, David is an expert in this type of situation, who does the customer want to give the brief to? David. Okay? There is no handoff problem at this point. So the salesperson goes back with David and Toe for the next appointment, which of course was scheduled by the executive assistant. Okay. David takes the brief. Under no circumstances in this model is the salesperson allowed to take a brief. The reason the salesperson is not allowed to take the brief is that whoever takes it cannot hand it off. They have to lurk around all the way through production. So the key to avoiding that handoff problem that you referenced earlier is to ensure that the salesperson never, under any circumstances, in a complex sales environment, takes the brief. They cannot do it. If they do it more than once or twice, they're going to get dismissed. Okay? No one's going to tolerate that. They go back with a project leader. The project leader takes the brief. Now, the salesperson and the project leader work side by side from this point onwards. The salesperson is responsible for looking after the commercial component of the sale. The project leader is responsible for looking after the technical component of the sale. They work together to come up with that perfect compromise between features on one hand and affordability on the other. So we now have a situation where the argy-bargy is occurring where? Here. Now if the argy-bargy occurs pre-sale, we don't have to be embarrassed about it anymore. We don't have to hide it from the client. In fact, our favorite trick when we work in technical sales environments is to involve the client in the argy-bargy because clients aren't stupid. They know there are trade-offs. They know that your production team has limited capacity, and they know that your organization has a commitment to shareholders to return a profit. So it's no surprise to them when you say, well, no, I can't do that, but I can do this. Okay, and they're more than happy in most cases to roll up their sleeves and sit down with you at the negotiation table and work with you to build their solution. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So at the point at which the contract gets sold, what happens so at the point at which the contract gets signed, what happens to the salesperson? They disappear. The only reason why they would continue talking to this organization is if there's an, another opportunity to prosecute. They disappear. Does the client miss the salesperson? No, because they have a new friend. And once they get into talking about the nitty gritty of the assignment, they want to talk to the expert. They don't want to talk to a salesperson. Okay? So Bob's off, or Susan's off talking to someone else. Okay? The project leader cannot hand off to production. So what happens is a project leader works with the production team to build a project plan and then chaperones the job through production. The project leader doesn't roll up his sleeves and get involved in production. If it's a big job, there'll actually be a project manager and a project team, and the project manager will answer the project leader. So here's the role that the project leader plays. During delivery, the project leader manages the interface between production and the customer. Now this is important. The project leader manages the interface between production. Now, here's why it's important. If it's a small job, you build it to spec, you deliver it, it's done. But a lot of our clients build big, complex things that take years, in some cases, to deliver. Enterprise software, for example. In many cases, the design of what you're delivering has to be flexible enough to change during the delivery project. Because the client's situation changes, or because you discover during delivery that some of your starting assumptions were incorrect. Okay. So that's why it's important that we have the project leader involved for the duration of the delivery period. Does that make sense? Well, the project leader needs to have a technical background, but let me tell you the trick. I'll get to resourcing in a minute, but I'll give you a preview of, of what the trick is with resourcing. If you go to a technical environment, what you're probably going to find is that most of the salespeople come from a technical background. 
most of the salespeople are actually better project leaders than they are business development people. So what we're going to do is convert most of your salespeople into project leaders. And so you're going to go from a team of 10 salespeople, who were probably doing a lot of project leadership anyway, to a team of two salespeople and five or six project leaders. Okay? Because, you know, those people are good at it, they're valuable at it, they should never have been called salespeople, they should always have been called project leaders. Okay? So now we have a project leader. And we're going to take solution design and give it to the project leader. What else are we giving to the project leader? Project management. Uh, that would be part of solution design, yeah. Okay, so we now have a situation where the salesperson just sells. Let me show you the model, what it looks like once it's built. So we have a salesperson here. Because the salesperson is now doing nothing other than selling, even in particularly in a complex sales environment, this person used to do two appointments a day, they're now doing four, two appointments a week, they're now doing four appointments a day. So we've increased the salesperson's volume of work by 10, effective work, by 10 times. That's an order of magnitude increase in productivity. Not the 20,000 times that Adam Smith boasted about, but 10 times is still exciting, isn't it? Think of it this way. To produce the same increase in work output in the traditional model, you'd have to go and employ nine more salespeople for every salesperson you currently have which is unconscionable, okay? Um, so there's the salesperson. Upstream from the salesperson, we have a clerical person. Now this clerical person, we're gonna call him a sales coordinator. But between you and me, this person is an executive assistant in every sense of the word. And the relationship that they, in order to be effective, have to create with the salesperson must be identical to the relationship that you see between a senior executive and his or her executive assistant. Now, think about what's special about that relationship. If an executive has an assistant versus an executive assistant, what's the difference? Yeah, maybe. Think about the direction of workflow. If an executive has an assistant, who pushes work to whom? The, the executive pushes work to the assistant. But if the executive has an executive assistant, a PA or an EA, then who pushes work to whom? The EA pushes the work to the... So what happens? It's a special sort of symbiosis that occurs when an executive has an EA. What ends up happening is this, the executive gives the EA responsibility for the projects that they're working on, the high-level initiatives. And the executive also gives this person responsibility for their calendar. The, cell, the executive assistant becomes really a low-level project manager. And they assign the executive's limited capacity to those initiatives. Yeah. So substitute executive and EA for salesperson and sales coordinator, we now have some clarity on what that relationship looks like. Now, when you build this model, you have to go to very special, you have to pay very special attention to ensure that you create exactly that dynamic. It has to be a very trusting relationship. The salesperson has to be prepared to, and, and it has to be justified for, um, um, the salesperson to allocate his or her calendar to the executive assistant and to simultaneously assign to the executive assistant responsibility for all of the opportunities under management now and in the future. So what happens from this point forward is the sales coordinator manages opportunities. The salesperson does appointments. Now the good news is in the scheme of things, assuming you standardize your workflow, opportunity management, even in complex sales environments, is extraordinarily simple. You do an appointment, and at the appointment you sell up to the next appointment, and then you get agreement, and you go back, and the sales coordinator schedules the next appointment, and that repeats until you get the sale. That's as complex as it, as it, as it, as it gets. Okay.
Yeah. So here. We didn't have promotions there. Okay? So some some organizations have a marketing department. I'll explain why in a minute. You're probably not going to need this piece. At least not the kind of cost that you're imagining when you say marketing department. Rather than marketing department, I'm going to assume we have a person here called a promotions coordinator, a person who coordinates your promotional activities. Now remember, business development is not just going out there and winning new accounts, it's selling new service lines to existing accounts. So if you have a person coordinating your promotions, a decent share of the promotional activities should involve going back to existing accounts. Okay? So we have a person here coordinating those promotional activities. Now remember when we talked about the design of the organization as a whole, we talked about queues of work. We said we want a queue of work upstream from production. At this point, production isn't the constraint. Sales is the constraint. And what we want to do is elevate the capacity of sales as quickly as possible until we can shift the constraint to production where it belongs, the bottleneck. In the meantime, we want to operate the sales function at absolutely 100% capacity. So here's what we're going to do. We know that the salesperson has the capacity to do four appointments a day. We're going to engineer this environment so that the salesperson does four appointments a day, five days a week, every week, come hell or high water, until we end up building for ourselves a queue of work upstream from production. If we do this right, it won't take that long. Okay? So the sales coordinator's job is to maintain a queue of forward booked appointments upstream from the salesperson. We use the term forward book days. That's a critical measure. We want between eight to ten days worth of forward book days in the salesperson's calendar. Oh, sorry, eight to ten days worth of forward booked appointments in the salesperson's calendar at all times. That way, even if the sales coordinator has a day off sick, the salesperson is going to do the four appointments a day, five days a week, week in, week out. Now, when we talk about an appointment, we mean a standard appointment. If a salesperson goes with a project leader to run a half day solution design workshop, we count that as two appointments, in case you're wondering. Okay? Now, the promotions coordinator's job is to generate sales opportunities. Now, if you remember what I said before, sales opportunity, that term is French for an appointment request. So a sales opportunity is not someone with a vague uh, appreciation of the fact that your organization exists. That is not a sales opportunity. That's a prospect. A sales opportunity is someone who knows you exist and who wants to talk to you. So it's someone who gave you a card at the end of an event and said, call me. Or it's somebody who uh, responded to your offer of a package as a result of your online advertising and, and received the pack in the mail along with an impossible to refuse incentive to have your salesperson go and do a capability showcase meeting with their team. Something along those lines. Okay, that's the job of promotions. So when promotions does its job, it maintains a little queue of sales opportunities upstream from the sales coordinator. Uh, technically, yes, but let me tell you something. You're not going to do a lot of marketing and advertising because you don't need to. Everyone I talk to thinks they have a shortage of sales opportunities. They don't. When you, you have a shortage of qualified sales opportunities, but you know what I think about qualification. What we're going to do is eliminate qualification. When your salespeople no longer qualify, you're going to have plenty of sales opportunities. You're not going to need to do anything fancy with advertising and, you know, you just need a, you're going to need to have a couple of basic campaigns that you turn the handle on. Okay, your sales opportunity, the, the sales opportunities that keep the salespeople busy are going to come from your existing account base and from inbound inquiries from the simple campaigns that you run. If you have insufficient sales opportunities, then after all that, then you've got too many salespeople. Reduce the size of your sales team. Okay, there in, in most organizations we work with, there is plenty of scope if you just fix the design of the current model without going crazy and spending lots of money on promotion. Okay. So the only piece that's missing is down here we have the, the technical resources. We have um, a project leader. And we have customer service reps. Okay. In the middle of this whole thing, we have the sales coordinator who is essentially a project manager. 
these resources around the periphery are the sales coordinator's resource pool to extend the project manager discussion. Okay? So what the sales coordinator does is allocates activities to the salesperson, allocates activities to the project leader, and on some in some occasions, for example, RFPs to the customer service team. And the customer, it's the sales coordinator's responsibility to make sure that if she allocates an activity to the customer service team, to make sure that the customer service person gets it done on time. Okay. In the case where there's a big engineering team and we've got an inbound flow of quotes, the sales coordinator takes the quotes to the engineering coordinator to get the um, promised delivery times. Make sense? We're almost done here, by the way. Well, really the, the project leader, yeah. If there's an engineering department, the engineering department would sit under under the project, and the project leader would normally be a part of engineering, is a, is a better way of phrasing it. Okay, so before we finish, there's the model. And we build this model over and over again. There are a couple of things I want to talk about. The first is management, and the second is how do you execute this in a small organization? So management first. I don't know if you've spotted or not, but management just got easy. I talked about management meaning managing by numbers. Here are the numbers. To manage this sales environment effectively, you need to fixate on these two numbers. You need to know how many forward book days in the salesperson's calendar, and you need to know how many days worth of sales opportunities in the opportunity queue. If you can maintain these two queues at their optimal size, you will have an extraordinarily effective sales function. Because if you maintain these two queues at their optimal sizes, you will know that your salesperson is doing four appointments a day, five days a week, this week, next week, and every week into the foreseeable future. Now, believe it or not, the primary driver of sales is not the capability of salespeople, it's the volume of face-to-face -face meetings. Okay, and even if your salespeople have capability problems, if you have them out there in the field doing four appointments a day, five days a week, they either get good at selling or they get out. No, they don't even have to get fired. They leave of their own volition. Yeah? It becomes painfully apparent to them that they don't know what they're doing. Okay. So let me talk about how in practice we, we apply this in a medium and maybe even a small firm. If I said to you, you've got to employ all these people, it's probably shocking. But the reason it's shocking is you're assuming that you're going to employ all these people on top of the people you've already got. But let me tell you something about Australia, and I hope you don't find this offensive. Australia, in the scheme of things, is a relatively small town. Now you can say it's not a town. Sure, there's 20 million people, which is the size of Greater LA. But it's not a town because we're geographically dispersed. But that argument doesn't fly either. Because most of the people who live in Australia live where? on the East Coast, and the three East Coast cities, or four, or five, depending if you want to include Auckland, are very close together. They're all within an hour or so flying time. So Australia is a small town. You know, we work with organizations who have five or six or 10 or 12 salespeople. Those same organizations, if they're in LA, wouldn't have five or six or 12 salespeople. And the travel times are just as much, if not greater, than the travel times between here and Auckland. Okay, so here's what you're going to do. If, you're going to, if you have 10 salespeople today, you are not going to have 10 salespeople tomorrow. You're just not. Okay, you're going to recognize that you actually have a requirement for one or maybe two business development managers. Okay, if yours is a technical sales environment, you're going to convert some of the remaining salespeople, the ones with technical skills, into project leaders. If you have 10 salespeople, and I know that few of you actually have 10 salespeople, the bad news is you're going to lose a few. You just don't need 10 salespeople. You never should have employed them all in the first place. As a consequence of losing a few, and of the fact that these people here cost significantly less than salespeople, you may have a slight increase in headcount, but you certainly will not have an increase in payroll cost. So here's a typical outcome. Let's talk about start an organization that starts with five. It's more realistic. You start with five salespeople. You reduce it down to one. Previously, five salespeople did two appointments a week, so that's collectively 10 appointments a week. One salesperson in this model will do how many appointments a week? 
20. We've just doubled the volume of sales appointments. Whenever we re-engineer an organization's sales process, our goal is to double the volume of sales appointments. To, double the to increase the volume by 10 times is ridiculous. You'll, just do, you'll do more damage than good. So that's what we will always do. We double the volume of sales appointments, and in most cases, you double the volume of sales appointments by reducing the sales team to one-fifth its previous size. Some of the remaining salespeople get, get converted into project leaders. With this significant increase in project leadership capacity, we see a corresponding increase in service, delivery quality, a reduction in errors. So the organization-wide implications are huge. We've just eliminated the conflict between sales and delivery. With the money that we save, we employ one sales coordinator. Possibly a, a promotions coordinator alone, it's more likely that we co-opt an existing person to do a small amount of uh, promotional activities. Okay? It's not as onerous as you thought, is it? So the first thing that you do is ensure that you have the opportunities sitting here in the opportunity queue. So at that point, you might want to say, well, we need to do some more promotion. But again, you don't have to go crazy. We're going to do some, I mean, we're big fans of online, you know? So we're going to run little ads on LinkedIn, and people click through and request a pack, and we'll generate a flow of, yeah? Or Google AdWords, or whatever the case is. Or you might even go and do some traditional media, but it'll be limited. It'll be conservative. You might have a basic, you know? When you've got to the point where this queue is big enough to keep a second salesperson busy, you employ a second salesperson. But I've got to say, most of our clients will reduce their sales team to one-fifth its current size and still have plenty of capacity to enable them to grow into the indefinite future. You know, when I moved to the US, we didn't employ another salesperson in Australia. I just come back for a week or so every couple of months. You know, as far as I'm concerned, Australia is another place to go and sell, just like Atlanta or, you know, Chicago. I mean, it's cool to come back here. The weather's always good. But it's just another place to go and sell. You know, I, I think Australians are too insular. You know, we say to our clients, why are you just selling in Sydney? If we're going to build a sales function, let's sell in Melbourne and Perth as well. And while we're at it, what's wrong with Southeast Asia and New Zealand? Yep, yep. Yeah, we have a client in Chicago where we built one central sales support team for the whole world. We have salespeople in Africa, uh, South America, uh, North America, um, a couple in Europe. So they had a French and a German and an English and someone in London, you know, and one sales support team. But in other situations, we might build two, you know, in different time, in different time zones. You want to centralize it because you get enormous economies of scale from putting these resources in close proximity to one another, and also putting them in close proximity to production. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I mean, if... If, if these people are capable, you want them. So what ends up happening is if you employ capable city pe salespeople in regional towns, you end up with them doing a whole bunch of non-selling because you run out of people to say to. Sell to. You say there's a lot of, a lot of big organizations to sell to in Toowoomba, but. It's, it's the case that you have a big company with a lot of staff, so it's ongoing. Yeah. Be yeah. So what ends up happening is you stick a capable person there and they end up doing mostly account management stuff. Yeah. What I would be doing is if, is, um, if you need to have someone local, have a delivery person or a customer service, an on-site customer service person, perhaps, but centralize everything else. All your customer service, all of your telephone-based customer service should be done from the one head office-based team. Sales coordination should be done from the one head office-based team. And the selling, you're better off having really sharp salespeople and flying them in and flying them out. And if you, because what the problem is, if you have someone who's a sharp salesperson and end up giving them a mix of work to do because they're in a regional location, what ends, up happen, hap, what ends up suffering is their selling skills. It's the first thing to go. As I used to say in the insurance industry, they get nicked in the head. 
You take a capable salesperson, have them do customer service. A month later, they're no longer a capable salesperson. Okay. Mini movers. Yeah, I know micro mini movers. Yeah. Yeah, and and his uh, his um, scheduling team for scheduling all of their production is in one location in Brisbane, and they schedule all of their all of the mini mover, movers work gets scheduled all over Australia from the, or whatever locations they're in. Okay, so this is the model. My promise at the beginning was that we're going to double your volume of new business transactions without increasing operating expense. Okay, I think you can see why we've. Uh, you can see the source of the claim that we're not going to increase operating expense. Now, what we've done is doubled the volume of sales activity. And in, in most cases, it's quite easy to double the volume of sales activity. Now, doubling the volume of sales activity is not going to relate, is not going to cause you to double the volume of sales transactions. But it is likely to cause you to double the volume of sales in dollar terms. Because remember, we've got a few things occurring here. We've doubled the volume of business development activity, and we've eliminated qualification which means your conversion rate has gone down on the one side, which is why we're not going to do double the transactions. But the flip side is that we've increased the margin that we're earning in transactions and increased the dollar value of the deals that we win. Okay, so that's the economics of it. The other benefit, of course, and to my mind the most exciting benefits, are that we end up eliminating the conflict between sales and production, and we end up with a model that we can, that's easy to manage and ultimately that's easy to scale. Now that's all I've got for you today. As I said in the middle of the presentation, um, if you like the story, it's going to be easier for me to tell the story to your team than for you to go back and try and replicate it. Um, uh, you might do a great job, but if you'd like me to do it instead of having the stress of trying to replicate the story yourself, then give me a business card, let me know, and I'll have my assistant schedule a time for me to run a... We're consultants, so we, we build these environments in our clients' organizations. In, but, but in terms of what comes next, if an organization engages us, the first thing that we would deliver to them, or the first thing that we would do with them, is what we call a solution design workshop, which is a, generally a one-day engagement that I facilitate where we actually design. Uh, so here's, here's what we call our standard model. But in many cases, what we actually design doesn't quite look like the standard model because of size constraints or because of technical constraints or whatever the case is. Uh, or because the organization is selling through uh, a channel as opposed to selling direct. Everything I've said today assumes you're selling direct. Or because there's a case to transfer a lot of the sales inside and build an inside sales team. So, so yeah, the first thing that we would do is engage with you for a day and build, a, and, and build, a, build out the solution. Yeah is a, a day's consulting, so four and a half grand, yeah. Mm. So expensive, but yeah, it's not a bet the company type investment. Yeah. Okay, well, yeah. So let me, yeah, okay. Let me go to a ridiculous extreme and talk about the smallest imaginable company, a company that consists of just an entrepreneur. Because uh, uh, I'll definitely cover off on your situation if, if, if I go to the other extreme. So imagine that you are an entrepreneur, um, you sell stuff and you deliver stuff on day one, and on day one you have no choice. You can't go and employ people, you don't have any money. Okay, so the question then becomes, well, how am I gonna grow? And you really have two choices. You employ people who, um, um, you employ people who do uh, who are less skilled than you, who free you up to do the skill stuff, or you employ people who are more skilled than you. You know, and that's the choice that people end up grappling with. Our, our, our suggestion, whenever we go into an environment where we're working with a very small company, is to say, well, the CEO inevitably has a lot of skills, but the one thing that we would like the CEO to be doing, because it's so difficult to find someone else who can do this, particularly at this stage in the ev evolution of the firm, is sell. Now, we got no hope of having the salesperson, of the CEO doing four appointments a day, five days a week, selling. Um, so the challenge becomes, how do we divide up the salesperson's time? In a big organization, we wouldn't even try the CEO's time. In a big organization, we wouldn't even try. We divide up people. We don't divide up time. 
but in a small organization, you have to be prepared to divide up time. So your second employee in a small organization is going to be a scheduler. So if you're the CEO, your first employee or your first hire is a scheduler, and that scheduler will take ownership of your calendar, and then that person will have a mandate that dictates that a necessary condition of their continued employment with your firm is that they have to maintain a preordained mix of sales to delivery tasks. Okay. So if we look at your work, the work that we're doing, we will discover that in order for you to grow at whatever rate you want to grow at, there's a mix that, that need to be maintained of field-based appointments to delivery-related work. So it might be 30 to 70. You know, 30% of your time should be face-to-face -face with potential customers selling, and 70% shouldn't be involved in delivery. So what's important is that from day two, we mandate that mix and keep it constant. So what happens if you're the CEO, John, is we would employ an executive assistant for you, and we would help that executive assistant to do all of the things that need to be done to help you to be productive. Okay, and, and one of those things would be planning your calendar, but they might do other stuff as well. It doesn't much matter. But the one thing that we would be firm on is we would say to the executive assistant, you must book 30% of John's week every single week in sales appointments. So we divide your week up into slots. We divide it up into, say, 20 slots. Threes into 20 is uh, seven. So we'd say to the executive assistant, look, there's a bunch of stuff that you have to do, but the, the activity that we need to take number one priority is the scheduling of seven sales-related activities, seven sales appointments in John's calendar every single week. That happens first, before anything else. And the good news is that sales appointments tend to be booked on a reasonably long time horizon anyway. So the sales coordinator books out the, appointment, the sales appointments in advance and then backfills the rest of your calendar with the delivery stuff. Now, in a small business, it's never going to be perfect. There's, there's going to be stuff that's missed, and you know, it's, it's always going to be a bit of a, um, what's the word for it? Uh, a scramble. A mad, I can think of rude words, but I can't think of polite words. It's always going to be a bit of a, you're dealing with degrees of imperfection. It's always going to be a mad scramble. But with the approach that I've suggested, the one thing that we've avoided is having a situation where you swing like a pendulum between doing 100% delivery and doing 100% sales, which is what ends up happening if you don't adopt our advice. Now, the problem with that is if you, go, if you have this boom and bust scenario, during busy times in production, you're not prepared to resource up production because you know that busy times are followed by quiet times. Yeah. So you always end up with suboptimal resourcing in production. But then you end up with production going through these quiet periods. So in the model that I've advocated, the flow of inbound work will be relatively constant by virtue of the fact that we've smoothed out your volume of business development activity. And that's going to put you in a position where you're more confident to add the production resources that you're inevitably going to need to add. And then it becomes a question of, you know, if we add some production capacity um, and we get to the point where we need you to do more than seven appointments a week, we either take production stuff off you by, by adding a production manager, say, or a couple of technical experts, or we take sales stuff off you by adding a salesperson. What we're likely to do if you're working with us is we're going to keep taking production stuff off you until you're doing almost 100% selling. At some point, you're going to scream at us and say, I'm not prepared to do that anymore, and then reluctantly, we'll go and recruit a salesperson. That salesperson will puppy dog you in the field. So we're not going to put them in a classroom and teach them how to sell. They're going to do nothing other than attend sales meetings with you, and you're going to replicate yourself in them. And by that point, you know, this model is essentially built. So when it's not like we're employing a salesperson and crossing our fingers and hoping, the be hoping for the best. We're employing a salesperson and putting them into this structure. And on day one, they operate per the structure. You know, and, and that reduces significantly the risk that's normally associated with adding a salesperson. You know, where you employ a geezer and cross your fingers and hope for the best. And in most cases, we'll employ a salesperson who's someone like you as opposed to someone who's a traditional salesperson. Make sense? OK. That's all I have for you today. I hope it's been beneficial. Give me a card if you want me to run a, a, a conference call with your team. Uh, and I look forward to uh, seeing you at some point in the future. You're welcome. <laughs>